in this unit, we're going to talk about data models. So data modeling or data models is uh, sort of how we take the database and we design it using either graphical tools and some of the uh, some of the techniques and uh, the established norms for databases that have been uh, created over the last you know 20 30 years or so so in this unit you're going to learn about data modeling and why these models are important we're going to learn about the basic data modeling building blocks what business rules are uh, how the major data models evolved over time. So we'll look back in time and see what we started with and how we got to where we are today. And we'll even look at some newer data models going forward into the future. Uh, we're not really going to talk too much about those throughout the course. I'll bring them up periodically, and we do talk about big data and things like that. Um, but our focus on this course is going to be the relational database models and then how models can be classified by the levels of abstraction. So data modeling is an iterative and progressive process of creating specific data model for a determined problem domain. Now, problem domain, let me explain what that is. The problem domain is basically what is the problem that you're developing a solution for? So usually a problem domain has boundaries. So we, we, we create sort of a, you know, a boundary of what are we designing for? What is the problem that we have that we have to solve? Uh, and that is our problem domain. And, with, and then we study that problem domain to discover what we can do to make data models that solve that problem. And the data models are basically the representations of complex real-world data structures. You may have be familiar with the term data structures from programming classes when you learn about arrays and hash tables and things like that. So we do talk about data uh, or data structures in this course. Basically, a database is nothing more than a persistent data structure. That's really what this is all about. And in many cases, you can start with a database and, and develop systems and applications around that data structure. And that's a pretty common method for developing systems. It's all about what the data needs are. And a model is the abstraction of a real world object or event. And those models are designed to make it easier for us to communicate with our users about our design and with our developers about the design so everyone can visualize that design. And if you think about it, models are nothing unique to IT and the databases. We use models in all other industries as well. For example, if you're going to build a house, use architectural models like blueprints and physical models to try to convey the design. Most of us can't really tell from a blueprint, so sometimes we make models that might be a little bit more intricate. Maybe they make computer models so you can see what it's going to look like. But it makes that design come to life so we can see how it's going to work. We're going to see, you know, you can even do walkthroughs of a virtual home or a virtual building that hasn't yet been built. It gives an overall view of the database organized data for various users, and it's an abstraction for creation of a good database. Making models helps us ensure that when we design our database, we're complying with some of the norms and standards that have been developed over the years for databases. So it help, gives us a way to ensure that we're complying with all of these standards and with all of the lessons that have been learned over decades of people designing and building databases. So some of the building blocks of these models the first thing we'll have is entities. An entity is basically an object that's being tracked in our database. So anything that we're keeping track of in our database would be an entity. And those things will have attributes. And attributes basically describe an entity. So in the slide here, it says characteristic of an entity. It basically describes an entity. So for example, you might have an invoice. That's an entity. And that invoice could have things to describe it, like the invoice number, the date of the invoice, um, maybe where it's being delivered or something like that. Uh, so those would be attributes uh, that describe that entity. All of the different entities have relationships to one another. So you might have relationships that are one-to-many, many-to-many, or one-to-one. -one. Uh, most of our relationships in our relational model that we're going to talk about throughout this course are going to be one-to-many relationships. I think that's going to be the most common that you'll see. And then there are one-to-one -one and many-to-many -many and so forth. So for example, you might have a many-to-many -many relationship when you describe uh, teachers and students, because students have many teachers, and teachers can have many students. Likewise, a class can have many students, and students can have many classes. And we're going to talk about, in this course, we're going to talk about ways to identify those relationships. We're going to start talking about that next week. You can also have constraints. Constraints are rules uh, to ensure data integrity, and there are a lot of constraints. And we don't always call them constraints in databases, but there's a lot of things that are sort of classified as constraints, and we'll talk about those throughout the course. I'll bring those up again later on. In order to create our database models, we first have to understand what we're modeling. We have to understand the business needs. 
And when we say business rules, we're not just talking about a business. It could be anyone. It could be anything that's using a database. It could be organizations, government, businesses, anyone that's solving a problem using a database. So the business rules are basically uh, brief and precise, unambiguous description of a policy, procedure, or principle. For example, if you run a small company and you have a policy that um, you know you can only have a certain number of things for sale or that prices never exceed a certain amount or that discounts are never more than 20% of, of the, uh, you know, the purchase price from your supplier or something along those lines, um, those would all be business rules. They enable the, the defining the business uh, building or the basic building blocks of our database or any system for that matter, and to describe the main and distinguishing characteristics of the data. So business rules are pretty important. We can start, any database design we do has to start with getting the business rules. Basically, where are we going to get these business rules? Well, we can talk to company managers, policy makers, people who run departments. We can look in written documentation like forms and reports and things of that nature. We can even look in standard operating procedures, which could give us some idea of some of these business rules. And we could talk with the end users. And it's important not to forget about the end users. A lot of times, a lot of the tacit knowledge about how things work in an organization lies with the end users. That sometimes management doesn't even know or they're not even aware of some of those things. So it's important to, to talk to all of these different levels and to get as much information as you can. I teach another course called Systems Analysis and Design where we spend two weeks talking about how to codify business rules from these sources. So it is kind of an art to go out and figure out what all of these business rules are. But our job is to get these business rules and somehow codify them into something we can use to design our database. So some of the reasons that we use business rules, it helps standardize the company's view of data. It can, it's a communications tool between users and designers. So business rules are usually how users will state their needs for a database or a system and allows the designer to understand the nature, role, scope, the nature, role, and scope of data and business processes, develop appropriate relationship participation rules and constraints, and create an accurate data model. And really, at the end of the day, this is all about creating that accurate data model. That data model is going to become the design for our database, and we're going to begin talking about that in much more detail in the next unit. Once you have all of your business rules, the next step is to translate those business rules into a data model. One of the first things we do is we look at those business rules and we have to try to identify what the entities are, the, the attributes about those entities or, dis, or that describe those entities, verbs which may translate into relationships between entities or among entities. Okay, So basically we're going to comb through these business rules and we're going to try to identify as many of these entities and attributes as we can. And that's our first step. And that gives us an idea of what exactly we're modeling, what entities have to be modeled and the relationships with those entities and so forth. So some naming conventions. Entity names are required to be descriptive of the objects in the business environment and use terminology that's familiar to the users. It really makes things a lot more clear to users if we use entity names and attributes that describe what it is we're trying to convey. Uh, it becomes rather confusing for users when we use special names that maybe only make sense to a programmer. I've seen plenty of databases where they do that. Sometimes it's a trade-off, though. You know, sometimes programmers say, well, you know, that description for that entity is awful long, so I'm going to shorten it or I'm going to come up with some kind of uh, acronym or something like that, which is okay, but uh, it is a lot more descriptive if you use these longer names. It pays off in the end. So proper naming will facilitate communications between both parties and promote self-documentation. When we talk about self-documentation, that means that the system is self-explanatory. You don't need to explicitly document a lot of things if, there's, if it's self-documented. Sometimes I joke and I say that in my software development, the documentation is the code <laughs> because hopefully it's clear enough that someone could read it and understand what it's supposed to do and how it works. Of course, in reality, nothing really is ever that clear, so we always need some degree of documentation. So when we first started building databases a long time ago when computers were relatively new, there were two basic models, the hierarchical model and the network model. A hierarchical model is a series of one-to-many relationships. So you have a root, and then below that root, you can have many objects, and below those objects, many objects, and so forth. So any particular object will always have one object above it in the hierarchy. 
and then it could have many objects below it in the hierarchy. A lot of directory services work this way. So if you are familiar with Active Directory or Lightweight Directory Access Protocol like LDAP or the X500 standard, a lot of those network, and even Novell for that matter, a lot of those network operating systems utilize a hierarchical data structure. So they are still common. We see them. And probably one of the most common database engines in the world is Active Directory with Microsoft Windows, which is used to manage user accounts, computers, and objects on a network. And that's a hierarchical model. The other model is network models. So network models can have both one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships. There is no root. Things are all interrelated in a network model. So it's a little bit different, but these were the two early uh, ways we could develop databases using a hierarchical model or a network model. Once we define what a database is going to look like, then we create a schema. So the schema is basically the, uh, the design for that data. It's a list of all the tables, um, which are really the entities and all the attributes, which are really the columns, which we'll talk about later on in a physical database. All of that stuff, when it gets defined, is part of the schema for a database. So what we're developing when we're doing a database design what we're actually developing is the schema. So we're, de we're developing that database schema. And that database schema with most modern database management systems is managed by the RDBMS. And we'll talk about that later as well. But once you have a schema, you can create that schema with DDL, or data definition language. This is how you create that schema. So when we make these drawings and these models of a database, one of our jobs is going to be to translate that into database code. We have to translate that into code that can be used to build the actual database. So we convert it from that model into an actual working database. And that's DDL that allows us to do that. And then once we have our database, we use DML to work with the data in the database, either to add data to the database or to change the data, delete the data, and so forth and so on. All the common CRUD operations, which stands for create, read, update, and delete fall under DML. So just like you would take a blueprint, which is a model, to build a house, so you translate that blueprint into actually building a structure, we do the same things with a database. We take the model and we translate that into code to actually build our database. And we're going to learn how to do that in this course. So the relational model is what we're going to concentrate on in this class. And this is the most common database model uh, or data model that we use for most database engines. We'll talk about some other models as well. I, I did talk about a few minutes ago that the hierarchical model, which is still in common use. The relational model is really an adaptation of the network model. So it's very similar to that network model. If you imagine all these entities sort of swimming around in a model and all interconnected uh, to each other, the relational model is very similar, but with a few more constraints. So the relational model produced uh, an automatic transmission database that replaced the standard transmission databases, which are like the hierarchical and the network models that we talked about earlier. And they're based on relationships. A relation is a table, or a matrix composed of intersecting tuples and attributes. A tuple is a fancy way of saying rows. So if you imagine a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, that could be a relation. And then that relation contains rows, or tuples, as they say in database parlance. And then the attributes are like the columns in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Now the main difference between something like Microsoft Excel and the relational model is that Microsoft Excel is a single table. Now you can have other sheets in Microsoft Excel, but they don't really relate to each other. There's no way to enforce relationships between different sheets, for example. Whereas in the relational model, we do this. And this is really what databases are all about, is having these relations uh, that are, you know, that, that relate to one another. So matrix is an important term here as well, although it's not highlighted. That's really the, the mathematical principle behind how databases work because we have tables which are basically a matrix of tuples and attributes. Those tuples again being the rows and the attributes being the columns. So a relational database management system performs the basic functions provided by the hierarchical and network DBMS systems. So it makes the relational data model easier to understand and implement and hides the complexities of the relational, uh, relational model from the user. In other words, with a RDBMS, you can develop a database uh, you can write the code to create your database, but all of the all of the programming implementation to make your database work is all happening under the hood. We don't have to concern ourselves with exactly how all that stuff is happening. So I would say that that the languages that we learn in this course are definitely very high level languages. 
um, you know, the, you'll see when we start writing SQL code, if you haven't done it before, we do have some other classes here where we do uh, database uh, programming. So you may have seen some of this before. Uh, but it is a very high level code. So a lot of this is abstracted from us. We'll talk about abstraction later on as well. So the SQL based relational database uh, application. So SQL is the basically is the language that we use to interface with a relational database application. Now I should mention that SQL or the structured query language is not the um, is not used exclusively for the relational model. It can also be used with other database engines. So uh, there are other ones that use SQL as the language that we use to interact with the database. So it's not just relational databases. So SQL is pretty important. We are going to learn SQL in this course. We'll concentrate on that in a few weeks, actually. Uh, we'll start going through SQL. This is when I talked about DML and DDL, or data manipulation and data definition languages. That's implemented with SQL. So we'll learn more about SQL later on, but it is important to understand that this is the language we use to interact with our databases. And it's important for us to understand it as DBAs and as somebody who's uh, going to be central to database design. So the entity relationship model is a graphical representation of entities and relationships in a database structure. Uh, you'll frequently hear them called ERDs, or sometimes they'll call it uh, an ER diagram, or sometimes you'll see E-R, uh, which uses uh, graphical representations to model database components. So let's take a look at some examples of the syntax. There are three primary syntaxes for doing these models for these diagrams. And these are the three that our book talks about, the Chen notation, crow's foot notation, and UML class diagram notation. So on the left, the Chen notation, I would say, is the least used. However, it's still important to understand it. You can see with the Chen notation, um, it uses the, uh, the numerals and the M and the N, uh, or the M and the N symbols for many-to-many -many relationships, for example. And a one and a one on each side is a one-to-one -one relationship. I'll talk more about identifying those relationships and how they work later on. But let's look on the right-hand side at the UML class diagram. So UML is a good option, um, but I should tell you that UML, the UML syntax is not designed just for databases. It's also for software development. Um, you can take a class. Uh, I teach a class called Systems Analysis and Design where you learn UML. The primary focus of that class is on UML. UML is a modeling language, so it's a, it's a standard for modeling software systems and even non-software systems like workflows and things like that. You can use UML in all sorts of ways. It's a pretty adaptable syntax, but it's not designed for databases, but it works for databases. Um, you know, you have tables that have attributes and so forth. UML class diagrams have a section on the bottom for methods as well, which we don't talk about in this class. That's why there's three parts to each of those entities. So for example, where you're seeing painter and painting, Below that are two additional boxes. The first box would be for the attributes. And the second box below that, the one on the bottom, would be for methods, which are things that you can do with a painter or a painting. We don't worry about methods in databases. We leave that to the programmers typically, although we can write store procedures and triggers and things like that, which we'll talk about later on. It's not the focus of this course and not the focus of database design. That's programming logic. So. The best notation for a class like this is probably going to be crow's foot notation. So in crow's foot notation, you have symbols that represent the relationships. So you can see here we have a painter, which would be a table on the left, and we have the painting, which is the table on the right. And then we have a connecting line between the two with those special symbols. So the way you read that, where you have the feet coming out, which is why they call it crow's feet, so the side that looks like a crow's foot with a single line next to it, uh, that is a one-to-many, so that symbol means one-to-many. And on the other side, the left side that's attached to painter with the two straight lines, that's a one-to-one. -one. So the way you read this is you start with the table that you're reading the relationship from, and you look across to the table to which it's connected, and then you read the other table name. So I would say a painter has one or many paintings, and a painting can have one and only one painter. Likewise, an employee has one and only one skill. And a skill has one and only one employee. And you might be thinking that's not necessarily true in the real world. And you would be correct that that's not always necessarily true. So why did somebody choose to diagram it that way? That's a business rule. So now we're starting to see how these business rules might manifest themselves in the diagrams. 
And on the bottom, we have an employee that is assigned to one and only one store. And a store has one and only one employee. Okay, so now that we have some idea of what those notations look like, and we are going to cover those in much more detail in the next unit, there's also some other types of data models. For example, there's the object-oriented database management systems, which is based on the object-oriented programming methodology. So an object contains data in their relationship with operations that are performed on it. That was that bottom block that I told you about in the previous diagram. UML is an object-oriented diagramming method. And attributes describe the properties of an object. So in the object-oriented database model, a class is a collection of similar objects with shared structure and behavior. And then you have class hierarchy, which resembles an upside-down tree in which each class has only one parent, which is a hierarchical structure. You have inheritance, where an object can inherit methods and attributes of a parent class. So unlike in the relational model, so if you think about this, in the relational model, you have a table that has attributes, but in the object model, you can have an object that has attributes from which it inherited from its parent. So you can have a parent object, and those attributes can be inherited by a child object. And again, typically these are, are modeled using the Unified Modeling Language, or UML which is a set of diagrams. We talk much more about how to do UML and how object-oriented modeling works in our systems analysis and design course. And you would also learn a little bit about this in a programming class, such as Java or C++ or even VB.net. You might talk about object-oriented design. So let's look at the uh, how, how this works in the real world. So you would have an object such as an invoice. So the invoice in a UML class diagram, the invoice has some attributes. It also has line items and customers. So the way I would read that is a customer can have zero or many invoices. An invoice belongs to one and only one customer. An invoice belongs to a, uh, or has a line item, one line item. And a line item belongs to one and only one invoice. In the ER diagram, we can read it the same way. That's the diagram on the right. So I read it the same way. I have a customer with zero or many invoices. I have an invoice that belongs to one and only one customer. My invoice can have one or many lines, and a line item on the invoice uh, only, or a line item only has one or one invoice. And that's how you read these different models. So, like I said, we'll probably use the ER model more frequently in a database class than we would use the class diagrams or the UML diagrams because we're working in a relational uh, model, which is the ER model. But in an object uh, modeling, we would use the UML class diagram. Now, I will tell you that these two are very closely related because frequently we're using class-based or object-oriented programming and systems that are using data structures that are in a relational database management system. So a lot of times when we're designing applications, we're using both models. We're using the object model for the actual software development and the programs and the business logic but we might be using the relational model for the persistent storage of that data. And a lot of the design decisions in the object side are happening from the relational side because a lot of times we're designing our database in the relational side. It is a lot easier to develop databases in the relational model, I think, for a variety of reasons and to implement them. Uh, and I shouldn't say that it's easier. It's that it's easier for us to have data integrity with the relational model. Data integrity can be much more stringent. We'll talk about data integrity later on. There's also the extended relational model, which supports OO features and complex data representation. So it's sort of a happy medium, which I sort of just described. Uh, and XML, of course, is another type of data model, but um, it's not so much as a data model as it is a way to structure data. Um, so it's a way for you to take unstructured data and, and uh, represent it in different ways. This class, I really won't talk about XML too much, but this is something you would certainly talk about in a programming class. Uh, but XML is, is a great way to take, um, to it, it's basically a very, um, you know, it has the term extensible right in it, but it uh, it's a way of representing data in lots of different ways. So you have a lot of leeway. Uh, there's no like real set rules when you're using XML, unless you have a schema. Um, so XML can use schemas, and that's when it becomes more like a database engine, uh, when you have schema, because then you have rules that you have to comply with. Now let's move into big data. So um, big data is another area of databases. So one of the problems with um, with databases, with the relational model, and sort of all of this is central to the relational model. We have in the middle our relational model, and on one side we have these object model, um, uh, you know, data models, and then 
We also have this big data problem where relational is great for data integrity and relational is, is great for, you know, for, for storing data and all that stuff and, you know, all the things that we talk about that are, that are great, which we'll learn later on in this class. But big data is more concerned with volume and speed and being able to analyze large volumes of data, which the relational model is not as good with. So a lot of times we're taking data that's in the relational model and we're moving that into data warehouses that we can use it with big data, where we can combine lots of different databases and sources of data into and get more intelligence from that data, get additional intelligence that we otherwise wouldn't be able to see in the relational model. So that's what big data is all about. So big data has some challenges. The volume does not allow the usage of conventional structures, right? We can't just use conventional relational models in big data. It doesn't work. It doesn't scale to that level. It can be rather expensive to implement some of these big data solutions. Uh, and there's also OLAP tools, which can provide inconsistent uh, uh, dealings with unstructured data. So a couple big challenges with big data. I'll translate these a little bit. They're huge. Big data is a lot of data, right? We're aggregating data from many different sources into one giant big data. And now that we have all this data, how do we efficiently process that data to answer questions? And that's where we have a bit of a challenge. The other thing that's a challenge here is the tools that you use to interact with those, which are the OLAP tools or online uh, data processing tools. Um, they can be... Um, um, they can be inconsistent and they're not easy to use. You can take a whole class on just learning some of the programming languages with some of these tools that exist for analyzing big data. Things like the R programming language, for example. Here are some of the database engines uh, that are used for big data. Hadoop, uh, Hadoop, Hadoop Distributed File System, MapReduce, NoSQL, so, or NoSQL, depending on how you pronounce it. So these are some of the ones you might see out there. But again, we're not going to cover these in detail in this class, but it's important to understand them and know that they exist. NoSQL is basically a database engine that's not based on the relational model. Uh, it supports distributed database architectures. It has very good scalability and fault tolerance. Uh, it can support a large amount of data. It's geared towards performance rather than consistency. So what does that mean? It's geared more towards speed than it is towards accuracy, right? So... The way I like to explain it is, if you go to your bank and you deposit money in your bank account, what's more important to you, speed or accuracy? Well, for most of us, accuracy would be more important than speed. I'd rather take a little longer for that transaction, but be assured that my money has been properly accounted for. But take Facebook, for example. In Facebook, what do you suppose is more important to most users, speed or accuracy? If I put a post on Facebook and for some reason it doesn't show up one time, it's not going to be the end of the world, and it's really not going to erode my faith in Facebook. I'm still going to use it. Most people would still use it. And I'm not presuming that all of you use Facebook, but I'd say that probably 90% of you do regularly use it. So in spite of you know any of those types of issues. But a lot fewer of us would use Facebook if it took a long time for our news feed to show up. right? We would probably go off and find something else to do when we're bored instead of trolling around on Facebook. So sometimes speed is more important than accuracy. And there are other business cases where uh, speed would be more important than accuracy as well. Regardless of all of these data models, um, a lot of these uh, data models rely on this idea of key value representation. We're going to talk in more detail next week about uh, keys and how keys work. But basically, you usually have an object that has a key. A key is something that can identify an object. And that's how we relate different objects to each other is through those keys. And again, we'll talk about this in more detail in the next unit. So some of the evolution of these different data models, as I said, we started out back in the uh, 1960s and into the 70s with the hierarchical and network uh, models. And then that led into the relational models, which started in the 1970s. So we've had uh, relational models for quite some time leading all the way up until the 1980s when we started getting these object-oriented models, which happened in the 80s. And then things kind of stagnated for a while until around 2009, we started seeing these NoSQL or these uh, big data solutions like Hadoop start to appear. And that's around 2009 for those big data solutions. So really the state of the art right now continues to be relational models. That's probably the most common data model that you will see in most organizations. Uh, things like, you know, there's, there's relational database management systems like Oracle, which we learn about in this class, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, 
um, even my sequel, Post Gear, and 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 so forth, Cybex or Cybex or Cybase rather. I'm sorry, uh, and a few other ones. IBM has a one called DB2. So these are all relational database uh, management systems. Probably one of the most common in industry. Um, I would say, well, there's it's hard to say anymore. Microsoft SQL Server is certainly very common now because it's part of the Microsoft ecosystem. Uh, so that's led a lot of folks to adopt it. And then Oracle, of course, is is one of the larger database engines out there as well. They're both rather expensive, but they both have free versions that you and I can use for free for small amounts of data. But for any sizable amount of data, they do get rather expensive. But we'll talk more about that stuff later on. So the earlier hierarchical models, here are some advantages and disadvantages. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about these advantages and disadvantages. I've already talked about a lot of this stuff earlier. So I'm going to kind of go through these slides and you can review these on your own later on. Here are the advantages and disadvantages of the network model. And then here are the advantages and disadvantages of the relational model. And then finally, the entity relationship model and the object oriented model. And finally, well, the real finally here is the NoSQL, which is the last one we talked about. There are some advantages and disadvantages there as well. Things like consistency and accuracy, which I talked about earlier. So these are just some comparisons of the terminology that we used throughout this uh, throughout the uh, this lecture um, and sort of some of the terminology that's used in these different models. So the relational model is the one that we're most interested in, which I think is most common. So in the relational model, we talk about a table, but in a network model, it might be called a record or in a hierarchical model, a segment. And then in the file model, it would be a file, which we talked about in the previous class. In the ER model, it would be an entity set. And in the object-oriented model, a table is called a class, which you kind of saw that earlier when I showed you those different, uh, those different models. A row in a relational model would be called an entity occurrence or an object instance in an OO model. Um, it might be called a current record or a segment occurrence in the hierarchical and network models and so forth. Okay, so these are just some of the vernacular uh, between these different models. I think this is a good reference uh, for if you want to be familiar with those other models for what, those, what that vernacular is. So I want to talk about abstraction uh, very quickly. So the idea of abstraction, um, basically what we're talking about here is how far removed from our data structure the user actually is. So you can see here we have our users at the top, right? There's our, that's our end user view. And there's a conceptual model of our data. And then that's logically independent from the internal model of our data, which is finally completely independent of the physical model. So what they're talking about here is at the end of the day, everything that we do with a database is ones and zeros, right? But that's abstracted from us. We don't see those ones and zeros. They're off on a disk somewhere. So there's these different layers of abstraction. With databases, we have even more of these layers. Um, so starting with the end user view, the end user has this conceptual model of how they understand the database. They're seeing tables and rows you know, and so they're seeing columns and rows, rather, they're seeing records and things like that. Below that is a internal model for the database engine. And then below that is how the database engine actually physically stores that data. Those three layers of abstraction that you see here, the conceptual, internal, and physical models are all handled by the database management system. Of course, there is, a, you know, the operating systems and things like that in between. For example, the database operating or the database management system doesn't necessarily format a hard drive, although some of them do have their own formats. Uh, that could be done by, say, an operating system. So that adds even more layers of, of abstraction with our databases. So again, it's the, uh, the external model is the end user's view of our data. Okay, so there's an example of an external model for a simple database. And we're going to learn more about, this is actually an ER diagram. We're going to learn more about ER diagrams in our next class. And then the conceptual model represents the global view of the entire database by the entire organization. So that's where we get our schema. And there's an example. Okay, and that's an example of an internal model. We'll learn about this later on as well. Okay. And then finally, here's our layers of abstractions for these different models.
All right, so we are done for this week. And in the next unit, we are going to discuss entity relationship modeling. So we're going to talk more about the syntax and the development of our relational models. So we talked about all these different models this week. You know, so you have a basic understanding that there's all these different models that we could be using. But we are going to concentrate on the uh, relational model with our database uh, design because that's the most common is the relational models.